Welcome everyone to our sixth Life After Lockdown event titled Corporate Purpose in a Post-COVID-19 World. Uh, my name's Prabhu Sivabalan. I'm the Associate Dean of External Engagement in the UTS Business School, and it gives me great pleasure to have you here today uh, to uh, listen to our, our wonderful panel discussing this very important topic. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I'd also like to pay respects to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. You can see our panel on screen. And of course, please bear with us if we have any technical problems. Uh, also, please send through your questions. Uh, you'll see the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We will have some time at the end to put them to our panel. Uh, and indeed, I know we've had some come through even prior to the event. So we certainly look forward to sharing your own questions with our esteemed panel today. Uh, before we, I begin asking uh, our, our panelists questions, I'd like to introduce them uh, and, and remind uh, all of us of uh, their, their wonderful attainments uh, in relation to this space. Uh, I'll begin with Alison Watkins. Alison joined Coca-Cola Amatol as Group Managing Director in March 2014. Alison is a non-executive director of the Centre for Independent Studies and the Business Council of Australia. She's also an independent panel member of the 2018-2019 Independent Review of the Australian Public Service. Alison's previous roles include Chief Executive Officer of Agribusiness Grain Corps Limited and of Berry Limited, uh, and as Managing Director of regional banking at ANZ, amongst others, many other senior positions. Alison spent 10 years at McKinsey and Company from 1989 to 1999, from 1996 of which Alison was a partner there, uh, before moving to ANZ as Group General Manager Strategy. She's also been a non-executive director of ANZ, Woolworths Limited and the Just Group Limited. She is a former Victorian president and national board member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. But what's most exciting for me as a, as, as a boring accountant is that Alison uh, holds a Bachelor of Commerce and is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. So you're one of us, Alison, uh, as well as the Financial Services Institute of Australasia and the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Um, our second panelist uh, is Tim Reed. Tim is the former CEO of MYOB and current president of the Business Council of Australia. He has a passion for helping SMEs build stronger businesses by leveraging the internet, marrying technology and business together to drive optimum results for clients, team members and shareholders. Uh, before uh, his time at MYOB, Tim spent five years working as the company's managing director and group product executive. In these roles, he gained significant operational insight and oversaw the Australian businesses, the MYOB's Australian businesses growth and its expansion into online services. Uh, a particularly uh, interesting and apt uh, 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 achievement of Tim's is uh, in, in relation to this space is his management career spanning markets in Asia, Europe, the USA and Australia. Tim has worked in Silicon Valley where he held senior management roles in sales, marketing, product management and business development uh, with a number of different companies in fast paced technology markets. Uh, Tim also was amongst the group of individuals who wrote the first set of advertising measurement standards for the web. Uh, and of course, as I said before, Tim was elected the president of the Business Council of Australia in November 19. Our third uh, Panelist is John Lydon. John joined McKinsey in 1996 and has worked in Africa, Asia, Europe and North America. He's been based in McKinsey, Australia since 1999 uh, and in December 2013, John was appointed Managing Partner of McKinsey, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it's fair to say that John has a breadth and a wealth of experience, not just in Australia, but internationally, advising and acting as a client counsellor of in, uh, for leaders in large complex organizations uh, from private practice to amongst the largest uh, state-owned enterprises uh, in China. Uh, 
Uh, John has led several large-scale transformation programs across multiple industries, banking, telecom, industrial companies, uh, resource companies globally, and, and of course, building lean manufacturing capability. Um, our fourth panelist is Rosemary Sainty. Uh, Rosemary is a lecturer in management at the UTS Business School. Uh, from 2008, Rosemary established the National Responsible Business Practice Project funded by the Australian Federal Government through Treasury, based at St. James Ethics Centre, building a world first hub of international initiatives and local resources. These included the Australian focal points for the UN Global Compact, the world's largest corporate citizenship initiative, and the Global Reporting Initiative, which many of you uh, tuning in today will know about, the most widely used sustainability reporting framework. Rosemary has recently completed a PhD at the UTS Business School, and she is particularly uh, aware of and knowledgeable of recent developments in the space of corporate sustainability and responsibility leadership at the board level. Um, our final panelist, and last but not least, is Professor Carl Rhodes. Carl is the Professor of Management Studies and Deputy Dean of the UTS Business School. Carl's research attends to the ethical and democratic dimensions of the future of work and how this future might be one of shared prosperity. Of special interest is how ethics can come to bear on contemporary business so that organizations, especially corporations, might be held to account by citizens and by civil society. The ethics Carl advocates is one that seeks to disturb the types of taken for granted cultures and practices that have led to mounting levels of global inequality, employment precarity, and exploitative practices. I'm sure you'll agree we have a wide base of very well informed, experienced individuals to explore this topic in some detail. Uh, and with that, let's begin. Uh, I might uh, direct my first question today uh, to yourself, John. Um, John, can you explain the progress that has been made to date? with respect to the expansion of genuine, of genuine stakeholder consideration beyond owners and shareholders? Yeah, um, let me start with a historical take. So I think it's fair to say uh, there's been quite an uneasy relationship between business and society and, and multiple stakeholders in recent years. And that context probably particularly evident in the last couple of years in Australia, where we saw some low points, such as the Hayen Royal Commission into Misconduct and Financial Services. We saw the Edelman Trust Barometer in 2018 and 19, I think it was 52% right, of uh, respondents said they trusted business, which was only slightly above politicians, um, but um, certainly not what business would aspire to be. Now, I'd say that, that in that context, you've seen a lot of individual companies, whether that's through executive teams, whether that's through uh, boards and boards with a particular interest in ESG, often uh, questioned by their investors in ESG, which is sort of economic, social, uh, sorry, environmental, social government uh, governance mm -hmm. considerations, to start to look back and reflect on, you know, what is it we're here for and what is our purpose? And while this isn't yet widespread, we're certainly starting to see some progress, or we were up until this current COVID crisis. So a couple of ways to look at it, and then I'm sure we'll come back to it later. So first of all, many businesses have uh, got beyond what I call the regulatory do no wrong stance, which they've had to consider, often forced on them by regulators and uh, by the media, by public, by uh, you know, post-royal commission and started to take some action. Now, there's been two ways we've seen that. One way is through specific initiatives that companies take. Uh, that may be, for example, a commitment to reduce carbon emissions. It might be on pricing or terms and conditions of their products. It could be more philanthropy or corporate social responsibility. Um, so that's a good start but probably not, not enough. But there's been many good uh, responses. For example, the bushfires, the BCA, Tim could talk more about this, but had a, a program called Biz Rebuild, where business really came together to rebuild uh, some of the worst fire affected communities. Now, what I'm excited about is when I start to see companies that are integrating social purpose into what they do and being prepared to make some tough trade-offs. 
So um, some examples of that, there's more probably in Europe, uh, we get companies like Unilever, which have made some specific statements on their products and their supply chain. Uh, we see companies in the US such as CBS Pharmacy, which got out of selling tobacco, even though that was a $2 billion a year product line for them. You know, Dick Sporting Goods, which got out of selling firearms, that was a few hundred millions of revenue, just because that was, they wanted to serve all of society and were happy to give up profit if that profit came from things that their stakeholders saw as, as doing badly. And I must say, we've seen some good responses to COVID of businesses that are willing to make sure they're looking after underprivileged groups, whether that's opening supermarkets early or changing the terms and conditions of, of products. Not wholesale. And the question for me is how business will come back? Will we build back better? And that's a live debate in many of the boardrooms and executive suites. Thank you, John. To, to that extent, the idea of building back better. A question I, I'd like to ask you, Carl, uh, with so much you know, enthusiasm for corporate purpose having been expressed in the past few years, you know, it sometimes felt that corporations wanted to take over some of the public responsibilities traditionally in the realm of government. Uh, COVID seems to have changed all this with you know, decades of calls for small government having been reversed as the state has intervened strongly and directly, both in the economy and in people's lives. Um, what do you think this means for the future of a, a new type of corporate purpose? Uh, thanks, Prabhu. I mean, that, that's a great question. And, you know, as John was saying, corporate purpose is, is somehow a kind of move against uh, a more traditional shareholder primacy where corporations think more broadly about the effects of their uh, actions on other people. Um, bearing in mind, however, that some of the big ways uh, and most important ways that corporations have and do contribute to people other than shareholders is through the goods and services that they uh, produce and sell, through, the, through employment and through the taxes they pay, well, not all of them, but the, the ones that do, the taxes that they pay that fund public expenditure. I think the interesting thing that COVID brings into question that many of these things, the ability to produce goods and service, the ability to, uh, to um, create employment and the ability to pay tax have been put in jeopardy for a lot of corporations with COVID. Now, an interesting example is Qantas, which uh, has long been praised for its corporate social responsibility and corporate purpose stance. Now, you'll recall, they were lightning quick to stand down flight attendants when the COVID crisis started. Now, I'm not criticizing them for that. That was a business decision that they made. And clearly, um, uh, in a sense, they had kind of no choice between this and, and potential insolvency, given that, that you know, travel almost completely halted with uh, the, response, the response to the, the, the virus. So in a sense, they had no choice but to make this decision. And that's in a part of the point here is this very thing, not having any choice. But of course, to have no choice means that you are powerless, that you have no options, that you have no uh, opportunity to, to exercise your will. Now, if you compare that, you know, last year in particular, 2019, was the, the year of corporate purpose in, in many ways. Um, culminating in January of this year but, uh, with the uh, World Economic Forum's meeting in Davos, um, as well as last year from the, the Business Roundtable in the US. But the kind of fanciful promises we heard from those groups last year seem relatively empty in, a kind of, in, in, in the world we're in, in the COVID world we're in now. And the question is, you know, it seems that corporations do not, and in my view should not, have the power to determine political agendas and decisions. Um, uh, so it's fine, you know, corporations have made uh, significant contributions in many ways to, to COVID, as John suggested. And it's fine, you know, if Google and Facebook give free ad credits to small business, and that's, you know, an important uh, contribution. Um, uh, but as you kind of suggested in your question, the most enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic advocates of corporate purpose have suggested that corporations should somehow take over uh, where governments have left off and it's somehow been a failure of, of government and corporations can fill in uh, 
uh, fill in the gaps. But I think what COVID has shown us is that the real requirements for gigantic fiscal interventions, for intrusive public policy, are completely out of reach of corporations. These are things that are in the realm of government and indeed should be in the realm of government. And again, you know, after the decades of calls for small government, again, as you mentioned in your question, um, COVID shows that government is very much necessary, even if in so many countries it has been quite ill prepared to address the challenges of COVID um, uh, it itself. So in terms of the future of corporate purpose, I mean, in one sense, I would have thought the best scenario coming out of this is one where democracy is revitalized through public institutions rather than the public relying on corporations that are beholden to private, uh, private interests. Um, now corporations and you know, capitalism more generally clearly have a very important part to play in what happens here. But I don't think the part they play is that of leaders. And so what I, I would hope is that the future of corporate purpose and what we might learn from this devastating crisis um, uh, is that corporate purpose is something that should be governed by public purpose and not by private interests. Oh, thank you. That is certainly a, a, a very important view to put across, the balancing of the role of government and corporations. To this end, perhaps it's, it's apt that we turn to Alison. Uh, uh, to, to ask you, Alison, uh, from your perspective, as a very senior executive in one of uh, our, our large, highly recognised corporations, um, how do you balance that pressure uh, to earn profit whilst also satisfying the needs of a wider range of stakeholders? When do these goals align and depart, especially in crises, and when are trade-offs made? Well, thanks very much, Prabhu, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it's a pleasure to, to have the chance um, to chat about these issues because I think um, it's a really interesting time. And certainly, yeah, maybe I can explain um, in a practical sense how we think about these things, and then um, then how it's this question of, of balance between competing interests, and then particularly, um, as you say, under the crisis, how that sort of gets put to the test. So look, first of all, um, I'd say um, very much at, at Coca-Cola Amatool, we, we definitely believe that ultimately um, we judge our success by the extent to which we are able to create value Oops, we just have a, an internet connection issue there with Alison. I might just give Alison a few seconds. It always happens at the wrong time, oh, it, doesn't it? It is the case, isn't it, Tim? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Alison will be sorting out those internet connection issues on her end. In the meantime, I might move forward to yourself, Tim, perhaps if I might ask for your views. Um, uh, Sort of moving from from the that senior executive perspective of a large corporation to a, a broader question around how businesses across all industries really you know how might they be better supported in almost in line with Carl's question uh, with, with Carl's point around the fact that you know, if government were to come to the party and and play that role in incentivizing businesses to do the right thing how might businesses across all industries be better supported to satisfy the expectations of stakeholders beyond owners. You know, in a time of crises where every dollar of profit is hard to come by, um, with many businesses missing or withdrawing their profit guidance for investors. Yeah, and it, it's, it's a great question and, and frankly a great debate, but I think there is lots of room for common ground too between what John described and um, what Carl articulated as his views of government and views of business. But frequently, I think this comes down to time frames. So one of the most challenging things running a business is thinking about what you invest for today and what you invest for the longer term. And if, if you know, if you stand back and um, and and you know, the most challenging decisions I had as a CEO was you know in developing new products 
you know, how much do we invest to develop new products that I know won't pay back for a longer time period and will be discounted by shareholders in the short term uh, versus, you know, how much do I deliver results today? And in a software business where you have to invest 100% before you get a dollar in, th those are always the most challenging ones. And it's not dissimilar in this debate as we start to think about the purpose of business. So how can business be better supported? Well, I think we do have to recognise business do, um, uh, the, the expectations of the community are that business does serve multiple stakeholders. You know, to Carl's point, the government expects that businesses pay taxes. You know, um, unions expect that government, that business will pay jobs, create safe workplaces, et cetera, for employees. Um, consumers expect that business are going to provide services and goods that are needed and valued by others in the community. So the business does have multiple stakeholders and needs to meet the needs of those stakeholders. I think the way in which um, business can be supported in sort of meeting the expectations of multiple stakeholders is for those stakeholders to be true to who they are and, mm -hmm. and honest and open in their engagement with business. You know, so from a community perspective, if consumers expect that a product is going to meet a certain need, um, then they articulate that by the way in which they act in the market and, you know, choose one product over another. Um, if consumers think it's important that a business stand for something before they engage with them, then, you know, the best thing they can do is to be clear about that. You know, that they do not want to do business buy from someone who has the following, you know, and you can insert whatever you would like in there. And that's a consumer's right. And by articulating that, you know, the market moves. Uh, you know, I think government can support business in this by frankly creating what they think is the right legal framework um, and then uh, creating certainty around that for business to be able to operate. You know, and there's interesting debates within that at the moment. For example, in Australia, um, it takes 100 shareholders to put a, note, a motion forward at an AGM, uh, whereas in most other countries, it's 5% of shareholders. Now, that creates a very different dynamic for AGMs for Australian businesses. Um, and so the government needs to think through those things as to what dynamics do they want to create in environments like AGMs. But I think the right thing for government to do is to create those mechanisms and those rules because they should be created by democratically elected institutions and representatives, but then stand back and, and, and let the rest of the participants in the market uh, play their role. Uh, you know, BCA can absolutely support businesses in, um, in sort of satisfying the needs of multiple stakeholders and particularly those beyond owners. Uh, by having members share stories with one another, by frankly at times leading the discussion and the debate where, you know, for Alison to do that as a public company CEO, she has her brand, she has her shareholders, she has her representatives. So it might be difficult for her to engage in a particular conversation around the AGM rules that I was just talking about. But as the BCA, we can absolutely have that broader conversation uh, because, you know, you know, we represent multiple businesses and can do it with our own uh, own brand and own voice in the market. Mm -hmm. So I think everyone can support businesses in this. Business is just a construct. Right? It, it's just the way the community comes together to create economic wealth, to create jobs, to be able to distribute, you know, um, goods and services effectively to other members of the community. And, and, and so, you know, how can the community help itself in this way, well, frankly, I'd say by everybody being open, honest, respectful in that, that conversation, but by everybody being present. Thank you, Tim. Alison, I do apologise if there were some connection issues there on our end, but it's great to have you back. Um, if I might ask for you to conclude with your, to, to continue with your uh, answer to that question uh, again around um, how um, as senior leaders such as yourselves uh, in, in large uh, recognised corporations that are often in the public eye, balance that 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 uh, the, the the profit perspective with other stakeholder views. Yeah, no, certainly. And maybe I should just quickly check where did I get to? I found I was talking to myself very eloquently. So you, I, I can say, 
I can say it was near the beginning of your response, uh, Pat, uh, 15, 20 seconds in. So I apologize. I might ask you to... Um, to... I hope that's, uh, that's not sabotage by one of your students. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Let me have another go then. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the point I really wanted to make was that at, at Coca-Cola Amateur, we think very much about the creation of value for shareholders being um, totally synonymous with creating value for society. So when we think about our overall, what we call our value proposition, it integrates our objective of creating value with shareholders um, and, and depicts it um, as being totally synonymous with also creating value for society. And we put customers at the center of everything we do and we believe that we need to create value um, for our customers, we need to delight our consumers, we need to contribute to a better environment, we need to have engaged people and committed partners. And if we get all of those things working well, then we will be creating value for shareholders and for society. And look, no better examples than, than sugar and plastic in our business. And I'm sure uh, you know, many um, participants would, would be able to relate, for example, to plastic where um, clearly there are um, very good reasons to be uh, greatly concerned about the, um, the build up of plastic and the failure um, of the, um, our societies to be able to adequately um, capture and recycle plastic. And that is contributing to um, an enormous and, and, and you know, looming um, pollution burden and particularly marine pollution. And I think you know, we've all been um, very, very disturbed by that. Now, for us at, at Amatul, we have committed, for example, to now we um, seven out of 10 of our bottles in Australia, including all of our water bottles, are made out of 100% recycled plastic. We believe that plastic is an amazing material. We believe, though, that um, it has to be captured and, and recycled and we have to close the loop. And so we've sort of stepped up to the plate and said, well, what role can we play in that? And so being part of all of the recycling schemes, um, um, you know, being fairly well down the track of investing in recycling ourselves, um, working with state governments to make sure those schemes are as well administered and, and, and um, effective as possible. These are all practical ways that we've been able to challenge ourselves to, to be able to help close the loop. Now, we're doing that um, because ultimately, um, you know, it's in the interests of society. It's absolutely also in the interests of our shareholders because mm -hmm. our customers come under a lot of pressure. Our customers care, consumers care, um, our people, their kids care, my kids care. Um, we all care about the environment. Um, it's much more than um, a fear of regulation. Um, there's certainly that is a that is a consequence, but there are many reasons why um, we should care, and ultimately that creates value um, both for society and for shareholders. And if we if we if we fail to address that, it's the same story with sugar. Um, our business. Um, will not be relevant in 10 or 20 years time. So shareholders would reflect that in our stock price. Um, and ultimately we would fail to create value for them if we don't address this. Now, I would say that um, it, what I've noticed over, over recent years and what makes this easier to reconcile because I think you know, the, the pressure used to be greater and more apparent in that I could go and talk to one set of shareholders who would just exclusively want to talk about financial returns and really um, not even mention those sorts of uh, longer term sustainability issues or um, societal value creation. Now it's much more, uh, I would say, um, a, an integrated conversation with shareholders. It's an integrated way of thinking about it for us. We've created our first integrated annual report that brings all this together. And so shareholders recognizing the intersection makes it so much easier because um, society tends to be, you know, there are many different stakeholders and it's lots of dis disparate conversations. When I go and talk to a shareholder, if a shareholder can also channel that, um, uh, that, that really, really helps and makes it less of a tension. 
Um, when you look at this crisis and, and how that's played through, I would, I would actually say that um, it's only helping. Um, and I would say our first instincts have been to, to do what's in the interests of our, our people, first of all, to protect their safety. We are in the fortunate position that we can also take some time. And so we've chosen to say we want to protect people's mental health, their financial well-being. We don't want to um, slash and burn expeditiously. So we've made that part of our sort of principles as in how we as a leadership group have sought to respond back by our board to this. That's not to say at a point in time, we won't have to make some tough decisions, but we don't have to act um, expeditiously and, 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 and we see value in not doing that. Um, you know, and, and, and I can't say, you know, that's a good thing for society. It is a good thing for society. It's also a good thing for our shareholders, I believe, because our employee value proposition, our reputation, um, I believe, will be stronger for that. Interestingly, um, on corporate reputation and um, the, the, you know, the deficit that we saw there, I know, and Tim may have mentioned, but we have seen some encouraging research through the BCA that um, the reputation of business is um, improved through the way that not only our business, but many businesses have responded, um, particularly in Australia, to the bushfire crisis and, um, and really stepping up and, and playing a responsible role there. But, you know, fundamentally, I believe that the um, interests of society and the interests of shareholders are absolutely consistent and um, and as a leader in a business um, that that makes um, the choices very obvious in many settings. Thank you Alison that it certainly is um, a, a refreshing view to, to, to hear you know a, a senior executive not just make the statement but give evidence of, of, of why that is the case. Um, if I can now move on to Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary, you've been sitting there patiently. You've, 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 uh, you're, you're clearly an expert uh, in this space, having recently completed a PhD um, in this area. Um, and you've studied this phenomena specifically from the perspective of governance and sustainability. And you've not just sort of um, read the books, you've also put it in practice, having convened some uh, literally, uh, you know, in international panels around this uh, to, to promote discussion and conversation and debate. How do you see organizations traversing the need uh, to satisfy a satisfactory financial outcome while meeting the needs of the broader community and the environment? Is there that very natural fit uh, the way Alison has suggested uh, might be the case in some firms or in a lot of firms? What, what has been your experience? Um, thanks, Prabhu. Um, yeah, look, I think um, it's a complex world, isn't it? And um, particularly, I, I think at board level, um, one set of tensions which is omnipresent is a sort of it relates to the temporal thing, the sort of short term, um, short term incentives, returns, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then the, the long term conversation. And I think. That, that will probably be always be there. But I, in regards to my question, Prabhu, I, 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 I wanted to just say that I think um, I, I don't see financial outcomes and social environmental social environmental needs as two separate things necessarily. I think that what the COVID impact has done is laid bare the core purpose of business in a sense, which is actually a social one in that it's about people. So that um, we can see pretty clearly that, um, you know, a business can become quickly irrelevant if there aren't customers or there aren't employees or there isn't a community in which to operate. Um, and so it's a little bit like what's happened with teachers and childcare, you know, the real pieces that power the economy. There's kind of been a big reveal that's going on. Um, and, and I think that's actually a good thing. I, and I think it has, I think there's opportunities for resetting certain um, myths and ideologies in a way. I think to, um, certainly from my perspective, um, I, I find that kind of se separating out 
the social pur purpose and then for profit purpose, un like an unhelpful dichotomy almost. Um, and, and that ultimately, um, it's about looking at the core purpose of a business and how, how to deliver on it in the most responsible way that it can. So in the case of Coca-Cola Amatol, that, that would be, you know, the way to look at it. Further to this idea of the COVID impact and, and what it's doing in that space um, for companies and also for governments, yeah, it, it has challenged ideologies at the political level, it sort of move from small government to very big government. And, and I hope that it does further challenge the, the shareholder primacy myth. So even though we have a, an enlightened group here, I, I don't know that everybody is so enlightened. And I think you know, not everybody realises that universally in law, um, board's fiduciary duty is first to the corporation itself, uh, not to shareholders. Um, and and that, that's actually a really important uh, principle. So you know, it foregrounds the best interests of the company, um, which, you know, hopefully coincides with the interest of the shareholder. And so in amongst everything that's happening, um, I do think that there is an opportunity to rebuild that loss of trust. And it's good to hear that, that maybe that is actually what's happening also from the bushfires. Um, and we heard a lot about the social license to operate, particularly through the Banking Royal Commission, I suppose. Um, and um, I'm very interested in this concept of corporate legitimacy. And, and that in a sense was being threatened last year by everything that was going on. I mean, major institutions with leaders that had some, uh, you know, importance for the entire community, you know, the whole thing looked pretty wobbly. Um, and uh, the, the point that I sort of wanted to put forward at this point of the conversation was that corporate legitimacy, um, has two key parts to it. One is the sort of pragmatic business case. You know, a business has to function. It has to meet the needs in particular of its key shareholders, which includes um, shareholders, key stakeholders and shareholders. And the other side of it is the moral legitimacy um, and, and actually having the courage to even use the word moral. So, um, you know, the sort of pro-social, multi-stakeholder, deliberative piece. And I think, Within that, there's a lot of space. And I think one missing voice in all of this, and certainly from my work when I was working on the Global Compact and the GRI and all of that, the missing voice was actually the workers, the employees, um, you know, that they actually weren't at the table with a lot of these conversations. And they are the group in a way that we are focusing on a lot at the moment that the government has stepped into into that, that space. So. I'm hoping that we talk a little bit about, about them and um, I've got plenty more to say, but I'll stop at that point. Thank you, Rosemary. That's, it, it's very insightful and um, it's wonderful to hear from someone who's, who's deeply studied this phenomena. Um, um, John, if I may ask you a, a, a question around the, uh, the incentivizing of behaviors that might align. Um, a, a question put forward by, uh, one of our attendees is, uh, and it, it, it pains me to ask this question being a, a diehard accountant, um, but on some level, is this problem not entirely one created by the accounting function, so to speak? The idea of us measuring on an annual basis, KPIs, targets, bonuses linked to incentives, and therefore influencing behaviors accordingly. You know. If, if the, the need to measure on an annual basis, for example, would not the companies and society's interests converge in the long run uh, if, if we weren't so wedded to that manner of incentivize, incentivizing? Um, and, and all we're witnessing really here is accounting period arbitrage is the question. What are your thoughts there? It's, it's a good question. I mean, people say what gets measured gets done, I guess. And then as, as many of the panelists have uh, pointed out, the actually it's a false dichotomy. It, at least in the long term, the interests of society, the interests of shareholders, it's kind of one on the same. And even more so in Australia, where so many of our companies are owned by super annual, big, big super funds, uh, where 
you know, society or bears the externalities and actually people probably own shares in the companies that bear the externalities uh, as well. So you, you wonder why that doesn't translate through to actions everywhere. And it's good, it's starting to, but we'd love to see it happen more. Uh, so we certainly have seen some companies reset the uh, KPIs, the way they report um, to still feature profit or returns, but also some of these societal measures that do all come together in the end. I think Alison mentioned integrated annual report. And there are a number of companies now in Australia using integrated reporting to uh, you know, not just have uh, the environmental or social measures off to the side, but bring them at an equal level with the financials. And then in terms of management incentives, uh, I mean, there was a famous case of Unilever that uh, the former CEO, Paul Polman, who was uh, uh, quite an uh, early sort of pioneer of corporate social responsibility, he was, he was trying to get the company to have healthier products. And the product managers were very loath to do that. It was a lot of trouble cannibalizing the, the products they had. So they changed one of their incentives. Instead of just the dollars of revenue, for the products, they also added calories per dollar of revenue. And guess what? They introduced a lot of sustainable and healthier products as a result. So I'm, I'm not sure yet. My curiosity would be whether we're seeing banks now that are introducing incentives about you know, how people are surviving, about creating jobs through business lending, uh, keeping people in homes, You know whether we're seeing telecoms companies introduce incentives for their for their staff on making sure people stay connected I, i'm not sure but maybe we are and i'd really encourage uh, boards and executive teams to start thinking like that how we can bring the alignment into uh, what everybody focuses on thank you john carl if i might ask uh, yourself we we seem to have um uh, formed a, a view here that really the, the, the needs of the shareholder as shareholders seeking a profit in a firm uh, and the needs of shareholders and managers as individuals in society should naturally align and lead to aligned behaviours as a result. To what extent do you, do you, do you agree with that premise? And, and, and if so, where is then the role for government? Um, I mean, you know, I'm quite uh, um, pleased to kind of hear the responses, particularly from people in business here, about uh, about this sense of alignment, and I, and I very much uh, respect that. But I think it's also important to look at this at a broader level of the economic system that transcends the actions of any individual corporations. Because if we look at the, the time period in which... Um, you know, leading up to the interest in corporate purpose and, and, you know, related to that and for a longer time, the growth of corporate social responsibility and the general, uh, this general development and this kind of opening up of the world to kind of globalized markets since, since the 1980s. I mean, this has also come hand in hand with massive widening of wealth and income inequalities, both within nations and also between nations. So while on the one hand, the actions of an individual corporation, entirely well-intentioned, uh, may see a, may see a, um, a connection um, between shareholder value and, and social value more generally, I mean, the economic system we have has, has produced uh, a series of, of gross inequalities where, where on a broader scale, the benefits of economic development and not shared equally amongst, uh, amongst different people. So I think we need to kind of look at it from a, not just from the actions of an individual corporation, but from a broader uh, concern. I think this is kind of where, as I was saying before, politically, these issues are bigger than any individual corporation. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, and really look at the system more generally. And it's that whole system view that we need to look at. And that really is more of a, a political uh, issue, but at the same time, many governments around the world retreating from uh, being prepared to address this as the billionaire class grows uh, grows bigger and bigger. So 
there's a, a question of what level to look at this and, 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 and where that debate should be had as well. Thank you, Carl. Tim, if I might ask yourself in your, in your, in your view, uh, advocating uh, for the needs of businesses, uh, do, you, do you buy that premise that inequality is, is increasing at a general level? And if so, what can we do about it? Um, if not, how can we continue to maintain and reduce it? Uh, well, certainly at a global level, it's hard to argue with it because mm -hmm. um, I, I think the facts would stand. Um, I do think it's important to differentiate between wealth and income when talking about inequality. Um, and important for us to look at Australia relative to other places in the world. So around the world, um, there's no doubt that the distribution of wealth has become more skewed as the decades have gone by. If you look at Australia, interestingly, if you look at economic um, value that's created by companies, the share that has gone to profits versus to wages and salaries um, has been pretty flat for about 30 years. So about 60% of economic value goes back to employees and about 40% goes to shareholders. Uh, it does spike up and down a little bit with the profits of mining companies as commodities go up and down. But if you remove um, the, um, the mining sector from that, it is almost dead straight. And so that distribution between sort of shareholders and employees has not changed in Australia for, for, for multiple decades. Um, and that's something for us to be proud of because we stand out as an anomaly in the Western world because of that. And in fact, if you look at um, the real income of the lowest um, paid employees, it has grown more rapidly than average um, across that time period. So, you know, there are some elements there that we should just, again, look at the, the facts and, 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 and shouldn't put them out of proportion. But that's all income, there is no doubt that it has been a very good time to have capital. And particularly in Australia, if you owned a house before 1997, then your income, your, your wealth, sorry, has grown far more rapidly than average, and particularly than those that did not own a house and have been locked out of the housing market. Um, so, you know, th those are the facts. We should ask ourselves, what have we learnt from there and what works and what doesn't work? Uh, you know, Paul Keating's reform of um, the, um, the labour market in Australia, I think is one of the things that led um, to some of that success. So the enterprise bargaining um, system that was put in place um, in the Keating government uh, was very successful in driving real wage outcomes and real wage improvements. Unfortunately, that hasn't sustained over the last seven or eight years. And I think we can go back and have a look at specific problems within the enterprise bargaining system that you can point to of things that change at that point in time that haven't led to, um, to, to continued progress there. Uh, but, but, you know, broadly speaking, I think what we need to do is come around and to Rosemary's point, you know, labour should be a big part of that conversation. You know, um, part of the challenge today is that such a small proportion of the, um, the workforce are actually represented by the unions, that often that voice isn't representative of all employees. Um, and, you know, that, but, but that doesn't mean that that voice of employees can't be, um, you know, should not be taken into account um, as we're having these conversations. It's a, it's a wonderful um, example you gave at the end there, Tim, because the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, would seem to have brought on an unprecedented level of possible cooperation between previously, uh, without being too colourful, warring sides uh, uh, from the point of view of the unions, uh, business uh, and government coming together uh, with Prime Minister Morrison's recent comments in bringing stakeholders together, much the same way uh, you alluded to Paul Keating, uh, the, uh, the uh, Keating government had, uh, oh, sorry, the, the Labor government of the time had done. Um, yeah. What it, 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 the opportunities? Sorry, Prabhu, I cut you off there. Oh, sorry, I was just going to ask what your thoughts were uh, on, on, on the, the opportunities that might come there. Well, look, I, I think it's a tremendous um, opportunity for us. And it, it, it was as though the political system, and by that I don't just mean politicians, I mean all participants in that community debate, that we moved to sort of smaller and smaller targets and 
you know, retreated to, to bases. And in some senses, um, we were pushed there um, because of the news cycle, because of the political cycle. You can talk about all of these things. Mm. But in many senses as a community, we hadn't faced a challenge that was uniting us to actually find the, the better parts of ourselves and come together in a gen genuine uh, moment to say we've got to look past just you know this immediate target and look to a, a, a broader set of targets. And you know most of the reform that came in that that Labor government, you know, it came from a time where the community was coming out of recession. And coming out of that recession, we had the courage to actually stare into reform that led to 30 years of growth. Now, I believe, somewhat ironically, that 30 years of growth um, led to the complacency that actually made it more difficult to continue to reform. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think what we are seeing right now is that moment in time where, as has already been mentioned, you know, businesses have had a stark reality. Well, actually, if I don't have customers, I don't have a business. And while that sounds very obvious, no one thought that there wouldn't be customers, except that we see whole segments of the economy right now who have no customers um, yeah. because, you know, because of the restrictions that have been placed on us. Mm. Um, so I, I do think that there is a moment in time right now uh, where m most parties are saying, you know, let's take advantage of this. Uh, let's all look past those small targets and shorter term, more immediate immediate needs um, and engage in a conversation where we're all willing to acknowledge that in the long run, we all do better if collectively we do better. So if the economy grows, if the distribution of that is such that it continues to be um, reinvested, um, which really means that everyone is better off because of that distribution, um, then you know that will flow back to all groups so that we can all do better again. Um, and I think if we can come together with that mindset, um, then there is a good chance that we'll be able to get some of the reform that I'd say collectively we've all yearned for for the last decade, but somehow been unable to um, to achieve. Thank you, Tim. Alison, if I might ask um, yourself, um, as in, in times of difficulty, what is that attribute of sort of leadership that, that causes a senior executive or a, a leader to take that leap and say, you know, I am going to think longer term. I'm not going to panic that profits are falling. I'm going to build consensus and, and, and get things moving in the right direction for everyone and not just shareholders and not follow a KPI as per that attendee question to John previously. What, 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 what is that quality and what, what can leaders really do in times like these? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great question. Um, if I look at the the leaders in our organisation and how they've responded, um, and 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 we have so many examples of um, of people who've just um, really acted in absolutely um, guided by the principles that that we said at the outset matter. Of um, first of all the safety and well-being of our people, secondly, supporting our customers, and then thirdly, uh, the continuity of our business. So I think um, it's been, it's been first thing I'd say is it's been helpful and important to know you've got, um, as an individual, you can make the calls and you'll be supported. And in this time, we've had people having to make uh, real-time calls very fast on the ground they might be, you know, in a relatively small part of our business, um, local, um, particular customer, and they've needed to be able to make calls. So I think um, having the confidence that they knew what we stood for as an organisation, and that we would, um, that they had our um, the backing, and and whether that's, um, you know, one of our our sales rep making a call about whether to you know, uh, give a customer credit for product that they bought that they had to shut their doors and they're no longer going to be able to sell or whether it's making a call that, you know, product that's sitting at Optus Stadium in Perth, let's give it away. Um, let's give it to, um, you know, to a food bank or one of these organisations, Second Bite. Um, for people to feel that they can make those calls um, and have that, that, that support, that's been one factor because I think... Um, our, you know, we have amazing people as 
and they'll make those calls um, when they've got that confidence. So that's certainly been one thing. I, and, and, and that's true for me, knowing that our board, um, you know, I, I knew that our board absolutely backed us and had confidence in the judgments we would make. Um, so that was one thing, I think, having that overall framework. Um, then I would say um, the second thing would, is, is what I see in our leaders is just the overwhelming sense of responsibility, the enormity of knowing that you have um, so many people whose, whose livelihoods um, depend on, on our organisation and how we act at this point in time. And then to understand the families, um, to understand um, the customers also, um, who also, you know, depend on us. And, and so to realise the difference that you make and the harm that if you um, exercise that responsibility poorly, you will, you will cause and, and, and the choice that you have and that you're supported to make good choices to help those people. Um, and no where more than in our, you know, um, countries that we have like Papua New Guinea or Indonesia, where it really is um, very much, uh, you know, hand to mouth. And so being able to keep people employed, uh, even if we have to reduce some hours or but keeping them in a job matters a lot. Um, so that responsibility, I would say, is the second thing as a leader. And then the third thing I think um, that motivates um, many of us is, is knowing that this will pass and wanting to be able to look back and reflect on how you conducted yourself as a leader, how we conducted ourselves as a team, and to feel proud of that. And whenever I've had a little wavering moment, I've applied that test and said, Imagine five years down the track, you're looking back um, and, and considering how you acted, um, then that often just makes it so clear what the right thing to do is and how I would feel proud um, to have behaved as a leader. Alison, thank you. It's, uh, it's five o'clock right now. What a wonderful way for us to conclude our discussions. Uh, I, 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 I really want to thank all our panellists for really speaking from the heart and speaking so passionately with evidenced examples of how we might traverse this balancing of economic motive and uh, operational, broader strategic stakeholder motives in a very difficult time. Uh, as we come towards the end of our panel uh, discussion, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. I'd like to remind you all as well that the recording of this session, um, Life After Lockdown series, will be placed on YouTube uh, for all of us to, to listen to or pass on to colleagues and friends. Um, and I wish all of you a very safe uh, and happy time uh, in this uh, time of COVID-19. Uh, all the best, everyone. Thank you so much. And again, my very sincere thanks to all our panelists today. Have a lovely day.